Okay, let me pray, and then we'll get into today's message. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your precious holy written word. I ask today that you give us eyes to see, uh, ears to hear, a heart to receive what you would say to us. Help us to grow and learn as we look to your word today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, uh, rise and shine. We've been in Isaiah 60, 1 and 2. There has been a ton of review in this series. There's going to be more review today. And one of the reasons why is because when we're teaching, this is the first time I've actually taught this series and this topic. Uh, It's radically blessed me. Uh, It's likely the first time a lot of you have heard um, this teaching. And so with that, we know that when we're introducing new truths, uh, that it can take a little bit of time for those truths to form in our heart. Uh, The way the Bible says it is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not from having heard. So when we're hearing repetition and we're hearing things over and over again, that's actually building faith in us. So with that, I encourage you, as some of this is review and repetition, to don't say, oh, I've already heard that, but actually lean in and let it build faith in you uh, for this truth. Amen? Isaiah 61 and 2, Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Through this, we've said three things. It teaches us that darkness will cover the earth and fill the people of the earth. I think we can all agree that that's actually a thing, that that's actually happening. Darkness is increasing, and there's plenty of it out there um, to, to see and to behold. Number two, that the church's future is bright. Even though um, the world is getting darker, the church is actually getting brighter. And number three, there comes a time when the church must rise and shine. And then with that, we said rise and shine means to actually stand up and become light. And that's been such a great phrase for me. I've, I've reminded myself of it throughout this series everywhere I'm at I'm just continually reminding myself Jerry stand up and become light when I was at the um, uh, get together last night for the young marrieds I kept reminding myself Jerry stand up and become light don't sit in the corner and be darkness stand up and become light and uh, so it's really blessed me to to have that as a reminder Uh, the second thing we've talked about is the fact that you all are significant we're all part of the body of Christ you have a specific light in you that was put there by God and it matters and if you don't stand up and be the light that you are then that light is going to be missing from the body of Christ so even though most of us feel like in the big scheme of things, we don't really matter that much. You actually do. You are extremely important. You are significant. And we talked about the fact that in order to stand up and become light in a dark world, it's going to require courage. The Bible has much to say about the topic of courage. And so we taught on that and gave you some tools to help you be courageous people. And then we said that whenever we see darkness in the world, it's actually um, supposed to be our cue to stand up and become light. So rather than darkness frustrating us or making us angry or causing us to spare or causing us to just want to give up and quit, what darkness is actually should do in the believer's life is give them a spark, give them a motivation. Oh, this is my cue. I see darkness. Time for me to stand up and become light. And again, we're using that word darkness in a very, very broad sense to mean basically anything that's not good in God, right? Um, So that's kind of how we've been using that word through this series. And last week we looked at Luke 11, 33 and 36. We're going to read it again today, talk a little bit about it, and then we'll uh, we'll get into uh, wrapping this thing up. Luke 11, 33 through 36. No one, when he is lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, and those who come in, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light." 
And so with that, we said three truths that we see in there. One is that we are to be seen and heard. We don't take a light and hide it in a basket or, or put it underneath a, a shelf somewhere. But when we have a light, we actually put it up on a stand so that everyone can see it. And so as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to be seen and heard. This can be a little counterintuitive because we know we're also taught that we're supposed to be meek and we're supposed to be humble. And we are supposed to be meek and we're supposed to be humble but we're also supposed to stand up and be seen and be heard and so um so that is a, a critical part of the believer's life i love uh, a scripture in esther i don't know if we've got the slide for it or not um but i'll read it and i hadn't read this one yet through the series but esther 4 14 i think the ladies are studying esther right now aren't they um, says, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And then I love this statement right here. Yet who knows whether you have, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's time to rise and shine for such a time as this. We are to be seen and we are to be heard. And then we said that how and what we see determines whether or not we're light or helpful or whether or not we're darkness or, or unhelpful. And so we are to be, um, as followers of Jesus, we are to be the light people, which to me means we're to be the problem solvers. I've said this a couple of times, and I always get a little bit of an interesting reaction when I say it, but uh, God is perpetually positive. And the reason God is perpetually positive is because God has all the answers, that's why God is light, and we are to be light, not darkness. So how you see things, how you view things, determines whether or not you're helpful in that situation or whether or not you're unhelpful in that situation. If you, if you see light, then you're, you're seeing solutions and answers. And I had a really good question from this on last week's message. Uh, somebody came to me afterwards, and I love questions, by the way. And this was a fantastic question that this individual asked. They asked me regarding this, you know, uh, um, being light and not seeing darkness and always being positive and always seeing the solution and always seeing the answer. And it, it doesn't mean that we, that we don't acknowledge the fact that there's problems on earth, but what it means is that, is that we have answers and solutions. And so they said, what about like the, U the war in Ukraine? You know, how do, I, how do I be the light or how do I be positive in that situation? And that was a really, really um, intelligent question to ask because this particular individual isn't in a place where they can go over there and physically do something about it. Now, there's other believers who are. They can, you know, they have the clout or the finances or the connections or whatever, and they can actually physically go over there and help make things better. But this individual could never do, couldn't do that. And so, you know, so how can they be light in that situation? And I said, well, in this this situation for you, you can still pray. And the Bible says that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. So when I see this, so for me, when I see the situation in, in Ukraine and I see the war there, I want my light to be good. I want my, if my eye is good, my whole body is good. But, but if my by eye is bad, my whole body is filled with darkness. So I want to see good. So if I'm going to see good in this situation, what's that going to look like? Well, I can pray. And the Bible says that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. So if I'm going to pray for this situation, I'm going to swing for the fence so my personal prayer for the situation in Ukraine is that somehow through this, Vladimir Putin would come to know Christ and become an on-fire, spirit-filled uh, follower of Jesus. Let's just swing for the fence, yeah. right? Now I'm being light instead of being darkness. I'm being helpful. Now, question, is Vladimir Putin actually going to come to Christ? Well, I don't know. He's got free will. That's up to him. But by me praying for him for that, something good is going to happen. He may never change. I don't, it's up to him. But, but my, my eye is good, so now I've become light. And here's what I know for a fact has already happened because I'm praying that prayer. I've changed. 
my focus isn't as much on me. Interesting. I'm not quite so selfish when I'm praying for him. Um, I'm not quite so unthankful about things I don't have in my life when I pray for the people of Ukraine. It's changed me. And if that's all that comes out of it, which I don't think that's all that will come out of it, but if that is the only thing that comes out of it, it's light. It's a good thing. And it's way better than being darkness and talking about how negative and how terrible and how awful things are all the time. What do we see? What and how we see determines whether or not we're helpful or harmful to the, solu- to, to the need. God is perpetually positive because he has all the answers. We can be too. Um, and then the third thing from that was we talked about how there's no room for darkness in the believer's life, um, which I kind of already talked about, just kind of this idea that, that just, just see the positive. See, see solutions. We're the solutions people. And even if the solution doesn't work out the way maybe you hoped for it, it's still, you've still stepped into the grace of God. You've still stepped into the light. Um, and good will come from it. All right, so that's our review. <laughs> now, now let's get into today's message, and we won't take too long with this. But in Matthew, the fifth chapter, we looked at this last week, and we're going to look at it again today, but we're going to focus on one particular part as we wrap up this series. This is Jesus te- teaching essentially the same sermon, uh, but at a different time to a different group of people. I love the fact that Jesus reper- repeated his sermons as a pastor. It gives me great comfort. Uh, Matthew 5 and verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. Notice this, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I want to talk to you today specifically about this phrase, you are a city set on a hill which cannot be hid. What I want to do is specifically talk about what is the purpose of a city set on a hill. Jesus said, you are a city set on a hill which cannot be hid. So what is the purpose of a city set on a hill? Number one, a city set on a hill is a place of refuge. The hill represents a place that's above the fray, above the darkness, above the weeds, and it is a place of refuge. Um, Structures, cities, buildings, barns, woodsheds, you name it, that we build on a hill. We build them on a hill because it is safer on the hill than it is in the valley. When the floods come and the storms come and those things that happen, the valley and the low places aren't safe, but the hill is safe. So as darkness covers the earth, you are a city set on a hill. You are above all of that. And so we live above all that stuff of the world, right? The challenge is staying there and not allowing the world to pull us down into the valley, and down into the darkness. I love the, the 91st Psalm. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. And then, of course, the 91st Psalm goes on to give you some tremendous promises, such as no plague or pestilence will come near your dwelling place. Just incredible, incredible promises in the 91st Psalm that all hinge on verse 1, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He who dwells in the high place. Uh, Some of you know, um, many of you know Pastor Marcos from Mexico. He's one of the the groups that we uh, financially support. I know a lot of you are on his uh, email list, and so he sent out an email list uh, email this week that I thought was so good regarding the 91st Psalm where he was reading it, and he got to verse 1, and the Holy Spirit just arrested him. He who dwells, and he said this. He said, you know, I don't yet dwell 
in the secret place of the Most High. He says, I visit it. And he says, and I even visit frequently. But if I'm honest, I don't dwell there. And I, and I think I could relate to that. I, I, I think I spend a, a lot of time living in that high place above it all. But every once in a while, something happens that sucks me down, that pulls me down into the world, and I begin to think and act and talk more like the world talks. But we are to be a city set on a hill, that refuge, that high place. And so, praise God, there's no guilt or shame, but we're growing and learning to stay up in that higher place. You know, when the political talk or the, the debate about the latest, you know, whatever thing, there's always a thing, um, you know, that, that, that's the hot topic of debate. And every time we come down and we try to debate or talk about it at that level, we become, we become like the world. We're actually supposed to be in this higher place, this, this refuge, this city that is set on a hill. Number two, a city set on a hill is a community. It's actually a place to belong. A city set on a hill represents a place that is welcoming, that people are actually drawn to. One of the greatest needs that our society has right now is the sense of community, the sense of connection. Uh, perhaps the greatest need that our society needs is the sense of community, the sense of connection. Um, due to uh, social media and, and Facebook, and, and people are figuring this out, society is figuring out this out now, there are so many people that are socially disconnected, um, but we've got Facebook, right? So, you know, we got like, I got 2,000 friends and I got 400 likes today, but that's all fake, None of that's real and genuine community. And as a result, we have more people than ever who are outside of community, who are isolated. We know that the devil, our enemy who roams around this earth as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, is a predator. And we know that one of pre the predator's go-to moves is to isolate people from community and get them alone so that they can fill them with lies. And so many of the, of the great tragedies that we're seeing, the mass shootings, we know this, that almost every time we hear about another mass shooting, what is the MO of the individual that did it? They were a loner. They didn't have any friends. They did not have any community. And so a city set on a hill is designed to be a place that people who are seated in darkness actually look up from the darkness, see the light, and they're drawn to it. They're drawn to and that oftentimes looks like community. Belonging to a community is one of our world's greatest needs right now is the need to belong to a community, and that's what the refuge is. That's what a city set on a hill is. I, I heard another pastor say this, and it was such a profound statement. Did you know that the disciples belonged before they believed? you got to just let that one marinate for a minute. <laughs> the disciples belonged before they believed. And some of them, it took them quite some time to finally believe. <laughs> one of them never did believe, but that's a message for another time. Jesus evidently invited them to belong Trusting that belonging would facilitate believing. We have people in our community. I hope we have people in our Sunday morning gatherings. And I hope we have more and more of them as time goes by. Who are not yet interested in the God we serve who are not yet interested in the Jesus that saved us, but who are very much interested in the peace that you have that they don't have, who are very much interested in the fact that when the economy is going crazy, you're not going crazy, 
who are very much interested that when the world is filled with fear, you're not filled with fear, who are very much interested in the fact that your marriage sustained a heavy trial and yet you're still married. We're a city set on a hill. Stand up and become light. Be seen, be heard. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works. After they see your good works and join the community, at some point in time, they begin to glorify God. They belong before they believe. And I've, I've just kind of naturally operated this way always. When we were in Owasso, we had a, a man who came and we found out he was a phenomenal guitar player, and, but he wasn't a believer, but he was a phenomenal guitar player and he wanted to come. So we're like, yeah, come on, belong. And we let him get up and, and play on the worship team. And, and man, I caught heat for that. You're letting an unbeliever on the worship team? Absolutely. What a better place for him. And, uh, and he'd get up there and play the worship songs, and we're sing, singing the same types of songs, and the glory of God would get all over him. And he'd turn beet red and just start to vibrate and shake. <laughs> and he had no clue what was happening to him. And I'm just smirking and laughing because I know exactly what's going on. And God's just getting all over him. And he, 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 he was welcomed to belong with us. And then, glory to God, he became a believer. And then he started writing worship songs and recording and he's connected all over the place. We've had individuals we've taken on missions trips and, you know, well, I don't really know if I believe in God. It's like, That's all right. Can you swing a hammer? Yeah, I can do that. Come on. You belong. Let's go. It's awesome. And then uh, the third and final point, and then we'll let you go today, is that a city set on a hill is a resource center. It's a place that people come to get a need met, to get, if, if, if um, we have this city that's on a hill and we have darkness that's covering the earth and deep darkness that's filling the people of the earth and the people in darkness look up and they see the light and they recognize that I have a need in my life um, that can be fulfilled if I can get to the city. If I can get to the light, I can get answers, solutions to the problems that I have. That's all Jesus did for three years was find people with problems and solve their problems. That's not all he did, but that's a lot of what he did. And then teach them the truth. As I said, there's, there's people in our community, they're not yet interested in God, but they have problems that they need solved. In Luke 179, which is a prophecy from, I believe, Isaiah 49, says that Jesus came to give light to those that sit in darkness. I'm going to read Isaiah 60. Uh, we spent four weeks in Isaiah 60, uh, verses 1 and 2. I would love to teach on the entire 60th chapter of Isaiah, actually the end of 59, 60, 61, and 62, because it's just crazy good. But we spent four weeks, and we couldn't get out of the second verse of 60. Today is Breakthrough Sunday. We're going to get into the third verse. We're going to put it up on the screen, and, and this, ought to just, this ought to just absolutely freak you out. I, if you even halfway believe this to be true, it's, it's going to create a reaction in you. All nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Verse 1, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is shown upon you. Uh, darkness will fill the earth, and great darkness will fill the people, but the... Uh, but the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. I, I messed that one up a little bit. 
verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, all nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. This is the church. This is happening. You might as well join the party. There, there, there's no condition for whether or not this is going to happen or not. This is the church. If you believe that darkness is increasing on the earth, and I don't think, I don't think anybody would push back with me on that, uh, on that idea. Darkness is increasing on the earth. Uh, it's getting darker, and people are getting darker. I just don't think anybody would resist me a bit on that. If you believe that, because this is one prophecy, one, one covenant, if you believe that, you have to believe this, because they go together. It's, it's, not, it's not darkness fills the earth, and, and, and great darkness fills the people, and then at some point in time in the future, in a time where you're not responsible for it, Right? Like maybe it's your great great grandkids generation or sometimes. So you're not responsible for it. It's in the future. Uh, then this will happen. No, they happen simultaneously. As darkness increases, light also increases. Light on increases to such a degree that nations and kings are drawn to it. <laughs> this is crazy. This is the church. Not, a, not us walking around knocking on doors. Can I, can I tell you about Jesus? Door slam. Knocking on the door. Can I tell you about Jesus? Door slam. Not, you know, can I pray with you? No, I don't want your stuff. None of that. It, it, it's, it's that our light is so bright that we, ha, we, we are standing up and becoming light. We are a city set on a hill, and kings and nations are drawn to our light. There is a going to the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. I love the go of the gospel. We go all over the place. I love going. But there's also a coming to the gospel where we are a city set on a hill where people are actually drawn to us. And the reason I know that this scripture is true and that I know this is happening now, this is not a future event, is one, because I see the darkness increasing. And so that's my trigger. That's my... That's my, that's my go-to thing, right? Darkness is increased. Okay, time for this to happen. And two, because I actually see this going on. I, I know people. I have not yet had kings or nations come to me. Um, but I know people who actually, this is happening in their life. Maybe I don't know them. Well, some of them I probably know. Um, one of them I know of that I'll talk about today um, I'd love to say he's a good friend of mine, but not yet. Uh, he's an amazing author, Bob Goff, who you may have heard of. He wrote the book um, Love Does, which was a New York Times bestseller. He wrote the book Everybody Everywhere, which was also a New York Times bestseller. He recently wrote the book Dream Big. He wrote another book, uh, Undistracted. Um, I've read all of them. They're all amazing. He's like this ultra-successful guy. He was a very successful attorney. He's a pilot, started an airline, just, just, just this incredible multi-millionaire guy who um, has this uh, uh, quirky thing that he does where he says, I quit one thing every Thursday. I quit one thing every Thursday. And so one Thursday, he walks into his law office and tells his partners, I quit. And he walked out, and he quit. And then he took the millions and millions and millions of dollars that he's making writing books and started building schools in Uganda. And he's become so successful at solving problems in Uganda. And what he's doing is he's actually taking girls who... Um, who have been sold into the uh, sex slave industry, he's going in and uh, with teams and physically rescuing them out of those situations and putting them in his schools and giving them a, an education, which in a culture where girls aren't really allowed to be educated. And uh, he's having such success at solving a huge problem in this country that now... The nation of Uganda and the king of, I don't know if he's a king, he's probably not a king, I don't know what he is, but the ruler, is actually coming <coughs> to him for advice. Why? Not because yet, although it probably has happened now, initially not because he wa I want to know about Jesus, I want to know about God. He came to him initially because you're solving a problem that I've never been able to solve. How did you do it? How are you doing it? He was invited, so these kings, this nation 
of Uganda has been invited into Bob Goff's community of believers. And now they're finding out that God and Jesus is not a religion. It's a person. It's a person who has the answers to all of the problems. And I just, I just know this in my heart that this is the revival that is happening. The reason this is going to happen is because you guys have the answers to the problems that they have. The nations and the kings have problems that they can't solve. But God is perpetually positive because he has all the answers. And you're his child. And you're the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill. And he's going to give us solutions to these problems to such a degree that people come to us. How are you doing this? How are you solving this problem? How did your marriage survive? How do you have peace? Why are you not afraid? Amen. Man, I hope this I hope this series blessed you. I hope you learned learned something and and uh, I hope it changes us. I hope it transforms us. That's why we do this so that God's word actually changes us and transforms us and we turn into different people. So let me pray and then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your day. God, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Uh, thank you for this teaching that you brought us. Uh, help us to be doers and not hearers only. Pray your richest blessing on each and every one now as they go. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week.